You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 82. For April 13th, 2016. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk about degree inflation. Why shouldn't managers hire people with graduate degrees to be field techs? What can we do to fix the field so everyone is paid well and so you have steady work? The answers may shock you. So go grab a club and a pitchfork so you can chase Bill around Tucson. And because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today is Sonia in Utah. Hello. Stephen in Calgary. Hi. Doug in Scotland. Hello. And Bill in Arizona. Again, from a minivan in Arizona. Good morning. No, actually, we're driving the Camry now. Oh, we're in the Camry. Uh, Jeez. Yeah, wow. yeah. 15 year old Camry. That's what I'm rolling in today. <laughs> well, you're, Good morning. Uh, you're, you're part of the 1% down there, aren't you? <laughs> what, the 1% of, you know, possible classic car owners that are just beating them into the ground yeah yes. yeah i'm part of that percent you know you know we'll 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 talk i, I guess it's kind of a conversation about the uh about the one percent the one percent of uh of degree holders no um anyway quick quick tweet i put out yesterday i realized as i vacuumed our house that you know you're you're definitely part of the uh not part of the one percent if you can vacuum your entire house without moving the plug on the vacuum cleaner so yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's what I realized. <laughs> uh, All right. So today we're going to talk about one of Bill's recent blog posts, which I think is what we're going to do for the next year. We'll just spend all our episodes talking about Bill's recent blog post and the backlash that it causes on Facebook. Um, and this post, Bill, was titled uh, Six Reasons Why Companies Shouldn't Hire Archaeological Field Techs with Graduate Degrees. And... Uh, there was uh, quite quite the comment stream on a couple different Facebook groups, but before we get into that, Bill, why don't you give us the uh, the the summary of what your blog post was about? Okay, cool. Well, the six reasons why post the origins of that comes from another post, or basically a realization that I made that nowadays um, job postings on shovel bums and other websites uh, are are basically asking for field techs that have master's degrees. And so I, I mean, I guess things have kind of changed since I was a tech. So I asked my office mate who's finishing her PhD. She's actually applying for jobs. You know, is this outrageous? Is it, you know, unheard of for uh, companies to ask for a uh, um, master's degree in a field tech position? And she said, no, no, that's just the way that it is. And I was kind of shaking my head like that's either wrong or weird. I don't know why it struck me so bad that, uh, companies asking for masters in for a field tech rubbed me the wrong way so i wrote a blog post about it and then i spent a week thinking about it and i wrote six reasons why companies should not uh hire um people with a graduate degree to be a tech now the thing that i think maybe a lot of people on facebook they just kind of skimmed right past them the first like two paragraphs of the post where i say there are a lot of reasons why companies hire uh folks with graduate degrees um, but they, they just kind of probably skimmed the entire post and, uh, or just read the title and were instantly pissed off. But, uh, yeah, my six reasons were, um, a graduate degree doesn't equal experience. We've talked about that many times, how you need to get some actual field experience if you're going to do a CRM archeology. span And that mainly comes at the tech level. So if someone with a BA skips the tech level, uh, and goes straight to the MA, they're basically getting their degree and going right into a field. Uh, in starting from the ground up that they may not actually in fact enjoy, but they're, you know, now uh, um, five figures in debt, which that was the second reason why I said that um, they shouldn't hire techs uh, with grad degrees because they owe a lot of money in student loans. A lot of the time Uh, you you don't get paid very much as a tech. And if you have to pay back student loans, you're not making enough really to pay them back and companies can't really pay techs enough, which leads to the third reason I pointed out uh, team dynamics and people who are really negative and frustrated about the fact they got a master's and they're not making enough money to even pay their rent and still have to live with mom and dad. So, uh, yeah, you know, you're not making enough money. You did everything right. And you got the master's degree because you realized that you couldn't get a job in, in archeology span without one. And now you're at the very bottom and you got to work your way up. And that's, it's difficult for a lot of people to swallow that. 
Mm-hmm. The fourth reason is because there's like this whole MA tunnel vision thing, and that really feeds into the uh, prestige of the the graduate degree. And there's something there's some kind of truth to this logic. However, it's not actually you know a, a completely logical uh, approach that someone who has a master's is somehow more serious about doing archaeology and they really want to, you know, do it a lot more than someone with a bachelor's only. So, you know, uh, bigger companies, they have these standards for the people that they're trying to hire. uh, And maybe they use applicant tracking software software that will filter out folks that don't have the highest credentials or, you know, the most qualified. But then also individuals, uh, I guess, when there's a, you know, you don't really know the person, you're looking through all these different resumes in a pile and you see several MAs, you kind of like have this attraction like, oh, well, that person has, you know, the most prestigious degree. So let's give her a shot because, you know, she's trying here because she's got a master. She's more serious. And you may pass over a couple other folks that have maybe one or two years of tech experience, even experience in your area. But you don't necessarily feel like they're serious enough, even though they spent two years as a tech mm-hmm. that you want to you know, hire those folks. Uh, the fifth reason is uh, it goes back to the, the education bubble, which I've written about before. I mean, college is not cheap and uh, going for more and more years of college uh, to do something like be an archaeological technician sometimes is not a very economically uh, intelligent decision, especially if all you want to do is go out into the field. You should be able to get a job with a BA, but there's folks with masters. You might get passed up for positions uh, just because others have a masters. And then as a tech, your career is always precarious anyway. And in this world where there's more and more people coming out with masters and companies choosing individuals with masters over bachelors, it either forces them to go back to school to just stay alive and be a tech again, or... Um, you know, drop out of the field. And uh, one thing we didn't mention last week, last time about the Paleska survey is it didn't look like very many people were staying in archaeology very long. Like five years was kind of the, you know, breaking point. And then magically after five years, definitely after 10 years, most of the people in that survey were not going to stay in archaeology or they're, you know, they didn't plan on sticking around. And a lot of that has to do with this degree inflation, the fact that you can be skipped for a job or even just kept on the payroll because you don't have the right kind of degree. And then the sixth reason was something that's actually kind of struck close to home a lot. I've worked for several companies and it seems like there's this like running meme or, or idea that field techs are expendable, kind of like a shovel. It's just a tool that you use to get your archeology span site dug. If they break, you just get another tech, right? Because, you know, it, it's a really negative thought pattern but i've heard it said out loud before you know she's just a tech he's just a tech you know well they're just techs out here i don't want you to think i don't want you to do anything besides just dig and fill out paperwork right Mm -hmm. so uh if you if you um privilege the master's person like well he's a tech but he has a master's so like you know he's one that's actually trying hard what does that say about the other folks that have a bunch of experience you know and I didn't actually include this in the post, but this, the focus on peoples with a master's uh, as techs destroys the entire possibility of someone without a degree or with an associate's uh, becoming a tech and getting into the industry. It, it severely weakens our chances of increasing diversity in archaeology because, you know, a lot of African-American, uh, other folks living in minority communities maybe uh, don't have the same, they didn't go to the same kind of schools. They don't, you know, necessarily have degrees or access to a university anywhere near their, you know, uh, reservation, neighborhood, wherever they live. Uh, How are they going to get in and get their people's uh, thoughts and beliefs in the whole uh, consulting process if they can't even get a job because you're hiring everybody with a master's and these people don't have a master's degree, right? So um, those were my six reasons, and uh, I think, well, A, following the blog post recipe book of making a, um, a kind of a, a, <laughs> title? a, a yeah, a, a catchy title, <laughs> you basically end up having people come after you with the pitchforks. So, um, yeah, yeah, you know, I have a feeling a lot of people heard the title and they were like, oh God, there's that jerk again making these blog posts. <laughs> you know, wh- who does he think he is? 
and there was a lot of people who were like, this blog post generalizes against all masters texts. You know, we're not all whiny wimps. We don't all have, you know, uh, a chip on our shoulder. And uh, there was a lot of texts who responded that were saying, yeah, this has been my life for the last couple of years. I've, I've trained my supervisor, you know, over the last four years again and again. And when they when I see this person step onto the site and they've got a master's degree, uh, it's understood that I'm going to train this individual and uh, they're going to basically replace me. And the companies, when the chips are down, they're going to get rid of the techs. They're going to mm -hmm. keep this person with a master's, right? So there, it, it went both ways. There's some people who were fired up and said that they were going to leave the Facebook po group. And I'm sorry if you're the Facebook uh, group. Please don't kick me off just because, uh, <laughs> you know, a couple people left. Um, I am a but, moderator uh, of both of those groups. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Well, don't muzzle me <laughs> yet. You know what I'm saying? Don't don't silence me. But, you know, this is a it's a really um, touchy subject because. We are all going to college to become archaeologists, and we want to like we want to stay in the industry. And just the way that I think, and the way everyone thinks, a college degree is important if you want to be an actual archaeologist. But do we all have to have a PhD? Do we all need to have a master's? You know, uh, I, I think this trend of degree inflation in making your uh, Doug, which I hope will, he'll speak about this a little bit more later. He wrote a post more than two years ago, maybe three years ago, that says your degree is worth less and less and less. Yeah. So uh, this this process fuels it. And then we're living in a time where college uh, loans and the price of college is astronomical. So if you're forcing everyone to go to school for $50,000 a year, a lot of folks said, well, that's a personal choice. And I was kind of thinking, yeah, that is a personal choice. But they're making this decision without actual information about you know what the market is really like. You know? Mm -hmm. You're, you're deciding to go to graduate school like, well, I, I've got to get a master's degree if I want to be an archaeologist, so I'm just going to do it. And then you get out and it's like, oh, my God, what am I going to do for, you know, the next 24 months trying to scrape by on all these tech jobs? Like, I absolutely hate this. And now I've got a master's degree. I don't like it. So what are they going to do? Double down and get a Ph.D. and pray that they can teach? Like, I mean, I don't know. That's that's not really. A... Let, me, let me jump right, in there yeah, for a second. Ahead. Take yeah. it over. Take it over. Because <laughs> I've got I got to say something because it's it's difficult to even have this conversation and and do it in the context of the entire United States, right? Because we all know that the whole country is completely different. Um, for example, in the Southeast, um, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to go to grad school when I was working in the Southeast, that's where I got my start, Southeast and New England area. Um, I wanted to go to grad school because that's how you got to the project manager status, right? That's like, that's like just, it was a requirement and you weren't going to be a project manager without a graduate degree in the companies I worked for anyway. And that was just the thing. And, and I had ambition to move up, right? That was my goal. So I ended up going to grad school and, and then immediately never worked in the Southeast again. I moved out West <laughs> where it's completely different. Okay. And out here, especially in Nevada, where I first came, you can you can have all the experience you want. In fact, let me let me give you an even better example. Um, there was a person that we worked for. He was actually the project manager, or principal investigator, I think, on a project in downtown Miami that my wife and I both worked for. Well, he ended up getting different jobs. I don't know what his path was, but he actually ended up out in Nevada on a project where my wife was his crew chief. Okay, she doesn't have a graduate degree. He has a graduate degree and twenty five years worth of experience, but because he didn't have any experience in the West. It didn't matter what degree he had. They weren't going to let him be a crew chief. You can't be a project manager without the right amount of experience to get the BLM permit. So he was a 20, 25-year experienced graduate degree person with you know working as a field tech here in the West because he wanted to work out here. And that's just the way it goes. Okay. Now, if you get your degree out here, hopefully... You know, it's there's more people that get a degree out here, a graduate degree out here that actually teched before they went to grad school, um, simply because of just like I said, just like the way that the way that things work. But um, Bill, that must be at least partially true in Arizona because I know you can't be a PI unless you've got you know all these crazy qualifications. But what are the what are the qualifications for like crew chiefs and um, project managers there? I mean, do they need graduate degrees or a certain amount of experience to work on, say, public land, things like that? Um, or do you have people moving into the Southwest that manage to luckily find a job and they have to work as a field tech because they're not, experience-wise, they're not qualified in the area to do anything else? 
Yeah, it's exactly what you said there. I'm, I guess I'm stealing the punchline for tomorrow's blog post, which I've already scheduled. But um, yeah, you know, uh, in well, this, Arizona, this podcast actually, will be out in a week and a half, so don't worry about it. All right. Okay. Good. Yeah, you're gonna have to read the, the follow up to six reasons why not to hire a grad yeah. student for uh, anyway. Arizona is exactly very much what you're saying. It doesn't matter what you know or where you came from. I don't care what part of the world you worked, you know, for however long. You come to Arizona, if you don't have Southwest experience, it's going to be difficult for you to even get on the crew. I mean, you can volunteer, but it's going to be hard to get on the crew, right? But if you know somebody and you've got, you know, a bachelor's or, I, you know, I've worked with a really a few great folks that have done a lot of Southwest archaeology that have a high school diploma or haven't even actually finished high school, and they know a lot about Southwestern archaeology, and they're out there as a tech. And I'd hire those guys over a lot of folks. It almost doesn't matter what degree they have because they really know what they're talking about. But that's the same case that you explained before. You can come here with 30 years of experience in Mayan archaeology, and you will be a tech. Because nobody's going to really hire, unless you have a PhD and you could get into like a research management position or something like that with one of the bigger companies. If you don't have Southwest experience, then it's difficult for you to even get on as a tech. You know, the, the problem with that is that, or, or one of the thoughts I have is, is that if you are switching regions, and, and I can speak from personal experience because I've just done that, um, that, you know, it, yeah. Having the grad degree um, on top of all that experience, yeah, you're still going to have to, you know, go back to the basics and start at the bottom. But it, it becomes a quicker route upwards, like that that experience and you know also the grad degree, but you know both particularly, you know, you're you're going to advance faster than if you. Um, didn't have that grad degree or all that experience in, in a different region. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's something I feel like should kind of be put forward. Um, and I had another, another comment. Oh, uh, yeah, like going way back to the beginning of um, Bill's rant. Um, <laughs> I forget which number that was, but the, the idea that s somehow it's the – employer's responsibility to you know like not hire people with grad degrees um because it makes it unfair for the people who don't you know why is that like if, if you know i i can understand like you want to get the people with the most amount of experience but if you you know if on the experience level they're reasonably equal why not go for someone with a grad degree and mm -hmm. it, particularly since you know that can be the you know, like a potential permanent hire. You know, if if you are thinking long term, and not just you know as a disposable warm body to you know dig holes for you, why isn't a you know master someone with a master's like a better better option because you have that option of keeping them on continuing. You know, I think uh, Bill mentioned that as as I think one of the comments on Facebook. Um, you know, if they hire a bunch of people, then they're worried that the, you know, at the end of the project or when times get lean, all the people without master's degrees will be fired and they'll keep the people with master's degrees just because they have master's degrees. And uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, I agree that that could happen, especially like you said, Stephen, they have, they have a potential in certain areas of the country to move up because they have that check in the block, right? They have the necessary um, uh, credential, I wouldn't say experience because, because of Bill's... Uh, First point, but um, on the other well, hand, it's a in, sort of it's, right? well, yeah, it is a different type of experience. You definitely do have more experience because you went to graduate school. You have experience doing things that other people didn't get to do just by the fact that you went to school, right? Right. Yeah. So um, anyway, I would say, uh, you know, in, in other areas of the country, um, specifically like out west here, you know, there are certain certain reasons why you would keep somebody with a master's degree over somebody else, like I said, so they can get that, you know, they can get the permit if you need that. But if you don't, I'm not sure how much degrees matter when, when they're starting to get rid of people. In fact, if you had a choice to keep a few people on and you didn't need some upper level positions to be filled later on, field techs are cheaper. I mean, from a management standpoint, field techs are cheaper. And if you got to make payroll over the winter and you're keeping a few people on, I'll tell you what, I'm probably not going to keep somebody on with a master's degree unless I need that degree because, I mean, they're going to cost me less. I mean, that's the dirty truth right there. 
So, but, but the, let's, the, yeah. Idea, the idea, you know, from a hiring perspective is that that person with an MA is a field tech and you're paying them as such, unless you need, you know, something more than a field tech. That's true. But I would feel obligated as a, as a manager and an owner to, I mean, maybe other people don't feel this, but I would feel obligated to give them raises quicker and sooner because of their, um, their degree and the fact that they, you know, they went to school and they, they quote unquote earned, earned the right to, to, to you know, to, to move up a little quicker like that. Um, that's a whole other conversation. And I probably just lost half our listeners um, when I said that, but um, <laughs> let's uh, hold on, hold on. No, let's, that, that, let's pick this up oh. on the, let's pick this up on the other side of the break. All right. We'll, uh, we'll be back shortly. <laughs> Archaeology and Ale is a free monthly talk presented by Archaeology in the City from the University of Sheffield Archaeology Department. That's where the archaeology part of Archaeology and Ale comes from. As for the ale part, the talk is held upstairs at the Red Deer, a great local pub on Pitt Street in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, on the last Thursday of every month. If you're in Sheffield, do come along, and don't worry, non-ale alternatives are also available. If you can't make it to Sheffield, never fear. You can listen to the Archaeology and Ale Talk every month right here on the Archaeology Podcast Network. And now, back to the show. Okay, we're back. And uh, we had a we had a pretty decent discussion over the break. Um, and, and this is leading off of what we just finished talking about in the last segment. So, um, you know, one of the things we were kind of talking about that I... I believe, um, and this is related to several of Bill's points, is you know the whole the whole companies shouldn't the whole title of the blog post is companies shouldn't hire field techs with graduate degrees. Well, people with graduate degrees, if they don't want to be field techs, shouldn't apply for field tech positions. I mean, me as a as a company owner, if somebody applies for a job as a field tech and they have a graduate degree and they're qualified and they're, they're, you know, they're a good person and they're, they're otherwise, you know, uh, would be a great field tech. Why, why shouldn't I hire them? Um, I mean, honestly, I'll get somebody with, I mean, from a, from a strict money standpoint, let's just take everything else out of it from a strict money standpoint. If I, as a company owner, hire somebody with a bunch of experience and a graduate degree, I'm getting a pretty high quality person. And it's not, it's not my fault that they can't find anything else for their graduate degree. They can't find an appropriate position and they have to or chose to or for whatever reason decided to be a field technician, okay? I don't see how that's honestly my problem. Um, and and I don't know. Steven, you got a good comment in the in the Skype chat. Why don't you just bring that up? Yeah, well, one thing, um, you know, those of us who have hired uh, need to consider is that um, when, when you are hiring someone who is – essentially overqualified for that position. So you're hiring someone with, with experience and a grad degree uh, to be a field tech that, you know, if they get a better offer, they might give them shit. And, mm. and, and, and I know I, I've known uh, several you know, people who also hire who won't hire a, um, you know, someone with a grad degree for that reason is that, you know, they're not going to stick around for a field tech position. Um, if, if they have a grad degree and not, not a lot of experience and they want to get that extra experience, you know, then that's a safer bet. But, you know, you really don't know. Um, and, and I, you know, I've even had a few pe- people who are like, absolutely, I'm on board and I'm not going to jump ship. And then they jump ship. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, so that, you know, that, that's a danger. Well, um, hey, let, let me, uh, let me give a, a real world example here because one of our other co-hosts, Chris Sims, who couldn't make it on the show today, he actually sent an email with his um, with his two cents, uh, and you know he wanted one of us to address that. And this is what we're doing right now. He said, um, he said, uh, grad students working as field techs aren't the enemy; it's the PIs who hire them way below their potential and milk the system. We're on the precipice precipice of a major surplus of extremely skilled labor, and the onus is on the managers to make the most of it, not on the people who got degrees at an inopportune time. Um, and it's ironic that he wrote that uh, that email to us because I hired Chris last fall as a field tech, and he has a graduate degree. Okay, so I'm I'm the PI he's talking about here, <laughs> and, uh, but I did do it for the Uh-oh. for the re- well, you know, and I did do it for the reasons that we're talking about here. I didn't know. <laughs> 
I didn't know as a company owner, especially a small company that's, you know, I don't really have a lot, any business developers and we're not really, you know, I'm, I'm into a lot of other things. So I'm not really interested in keeping the CRM side of my, my business, like constantly at a hundred percent. Um, and, but if it, if other projects did come along, you know, I, I knew Chris from before because of a couple things we'd interacted with. And I knew that he had a lot of potential in some other areas of things I was working with. I mean, the podcast network, things like that. And I had every intention, if the work was there, to keep him on doing some other things. And it just worked out that I didn't keep anybody on. So, um, but I would have because, you know, it, not just because he had a graduate degree, though. It, it would have helped, especially working here in Nevada. But it uh, it wasn't the only thing. But, um, but yeah, you know, he... I, I, I just put it out there as a, as a position and him and his girlfriend who doesn't have a graduate degree. So she was in the good spot, you know, for that position, but they were, you know, they, they responded to my inquiries, uh, and knowing full well, it was a field technician job. So again, not really my fault, um, to, to say that. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know where else to go with that, but, uh, that's pretty much what I was talking about. And, and, and you know, Steven, he would have been more than, it would have been more than appropriate for him to jump ship for a position where he was a project manager. And me as a, as a company owner, I shouldn't have been upset about that. If I can't offer him the position that he wants or, or deserves as his experience, you know, he's got 10 years of experience, a uh, graduate degree, he should be a project manager somewhere. And if he got that job, then more power to him. I should be happy that he found a job as a project manager and not sad that he had to leave my company, you know, if I couldn't offer that. So I don't know. Yeah. The, the blog post really, the, the, it was titled that way because it, not of situations like what you were just talking about where the individual applied, but situations where you need a group of individuals to work as techs and you just basically look at the MA and are like, well, these guys have a couple years of experience and a master's, so they're diamonds in the rough that we can actually hone into something that might, you know, might, in quotation marks, survive to the next round or if if there is work or i'm going to keep them on or something like that and you just kind of push the other ba <laughs> stack away right like all the people who i mean so a if you're gonna go for a job you should actually know who the hell's at the company so that you can talk to them and they'll know who you are right that's the whole networking building your network you don't have to really actually apply for anything i mean chris was applying but you already knew him so it yeah. wasn't like he was just a, a, you know, an individual that you're looking through a stack of resumes. But in these situations where you are looking through a stack of resumes and you just start grabbing out all the MAs, like, well, you know, this person has potential, that person has potential, that's fueling this entire process, right? So all the BA people who can't find work are like, oh, man, all the masters is are getting the jobs. I better go back to school for a master's, right? It is a personal decision. It is a decision based on the idea that uh, companies prefer masters folks but it leads to high attrition rates and a loss of uh, knowledge within the industry because a lot of the folks that have been longtime techs they know a lot more than almost anybody except for the pi at that company but you know <laughs> they get passed up a million times again and again and again you can only live so long on unemployment and then like either you go back for a masters which fuels the cycle or you find a job somewhere else prolonging the inevitability and or you just drop out of the market and so that just, if you know the individual and they've got a master's and you know they're your friend or a coworker, an acquaintance, they're trying to get regional experience, come out West, which, you know, I can't recommend for everybody to do because then there won't be anything for me to do. But yeah, out West, you know, it is kind of, it's better <laughs> yeah. as far as like the wages and everything and, and, you know, the amount of projects, cause there's a lot of public land. But anyway, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother rant. <laughs> if you have a stack of resumes, like I said in there, and you just swipe all the BAs to the side, including a couple folks who like know everything, and grab the masters. Is that that's exactly why I titled the post that way? That and it's clickbait. <laughs> I guess, or 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 podcast bait. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's totally it's clickbait. Like like most of the titles are clickbait. <laughs> true. Hey, uh, you know, I, I learned from the masters. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think we've kind of skipped over a part where we're, you know, the whole part of Bill's thing and my post from years ago is there, there's sort of degree inflation. There's a lot more people with masters and a lot more people with PhDs uh, these days. than there were, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but it doesn't mean that people with masters 
are getting the jobs. I know we've touched on part of that, but like the hiring process is quite complicated. I'd say, at least in my experience in archaeology, they don't divide piles of resumes into who has a master's, who has a BA. They divide the pile into who have we worked for before and still like, who do I flip when I'm flipping through, can I check up? So that sort of informal uh, conversation, oh, this person worked for the company across town. I can, I know people at that company who I can talk to to find out if this person is good. You know, it's a lot more complicated than just simply ticking a box. Um, and mm -hmm. in some places to use it because they do get a ton of resumes. And that's because people don't know how to find a job, which is a lot of networking and cold calling. It's It's amazing, like, so you're looking at shovel bums and archaeo field techs and stuff like that in America or Badger. And whenever someone puts up a post, they get like a hundred resumes. I mean, it's not, it's not that bad anymore because, you know, the economy is going better, but you know, 2009, 2010, you, you get 200 resumes, maybe 300 for a single position. And yeah, that's when they put that up. But so many jobs happen and go out, we don't actually need a master's. Uh, and I think there's a general push of more and more people getting higher degrees, but it's not quite to the point yet where you absolutely need to have a master's. And it is only for certain states. And for people, you know, Secretary of Interior requires a master's to get a permit. And that's why people sort of require that. But honestly, you do not need a master's to do most archaeology jobs other than that one very small part for permits and you know some states have permits as well that you know the statewide permit requires a degree if they want to um, but this is also not just an archaeology problem this is a u.s wide worldwide problem um, i think the numbers now are under 35 more than half of people have a ba and most people, the, like two thirds of Americans, you know, under like 35 have gone to university. Doesn't mean they've all got degrees. There's a really high dropout rate, which caused this whole thing. But this is not an archaeology only problem. This is, you know, a UK problem in archaeology. This is a engineering problem. This is a software problem. This is, um, oh gosh, pick a discipline and you basically find that there are more people than there are jobs. And so, you know, degrees are going up, and it's a huge problem. I mean, mm -hmm. Obama, when he when they do that big speech for the government, I'm sorry, guys, I'm ranting for the last, like, five minutes, but <laughs> I'll finish this up, is, you know, they basically say, oh, we're going to make, uh, you know, community college free because a community college or a degree is a, you know, a passport to a better life. And it is somewhat true. Jobs that require degrees do pay better, but that is a huge complication and people are seeing a, you know, a cause and effect and really it's complicated that people that have degrees tend to have higher skills to begin with, tend to be richer, tend to come from you know better family backgrounds so that they're already ahead and a degree just sort of marks that but doesn't necessarily mean that the degree gave them those skills. So there's this huge push and I know you guys have had this in the conversation about like, oh, you know, it's not, it's not our fault that you know people went out and took you know on fifty thousand dollars worth of um, student loans. And I agree, it's not companies' faults that you know they have a bunch of people with master's degrees with tons of debt. Um, but it is a society-wide problem. This is a massive U.S.-wide problem of. You know, university's gone above inflation since the 1970s. You used to be able, you could work and actually go to school. You can't do that anymore. You have to take out loans, have to be on scholarship, or have to have a rich family. It's a huge society-wide problem that needs to be tackled. Um, I don't think necessarily it should be put on, you know, CRM companies shouldn't be the ones that have to deal with this. All society should have to deal with this. Um, right. But it's something that we have to come to grips with, and not just archaeology, everywhere. I, I got something to say. I'm going to jump in for the first <laughs> time today. First of all, um, uh, you know, I read through Bill's post, and uh, for the most part, we agree. 
bill. So no no problems there. What started bothering me most were the reactions and the and the very in some way very aggressive and hostile reactions that that people on Facebook got. And you did have a title, to be fair, you did have a title that was kind of that clickbait sort of feel to it. <laughs> but because it's you're meant to click on it, and you're meant to get a rise out of it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I have to remind people is you need to take ownership for your own actions. Um, first of all, again, as, as Doug was saying, it, it's not the company's fault that you work for that you went to Harvard or to a $50,000 a year school to get your degrees. We're not responsible for paying your, uh, it's not the company's response, uh, responsibility to pay your student loans. Additionally, you applied for a specific position that you knew when you applied for that position that that position paid between X and Y amount of dollars and had a certain number of benefits. Um, you accepted that position or you refused that position. If you accepted it, that's what you applied for. Uh, the, 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 companies, the companies requesting people qualified for that position, it doesn't matter uh, from a company's perspective, whether or not you have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a PhD. That position pays what that position pays. And um, I, I mean, I, I, get, I get kind of frustrated ab about that because I had, I'd post, this was years ago, I posted uh, a request um, for, I think it was maybe a 15 or $16 an hour field technician position in the Western US. And I had an applicant with virtually no experience uh, and a PhD applying um, for that position. And when we interviewed him, he was like, no, I want $80,000 a year, full-time job and benefits. And I'm like, you do understand <laughs> what you applied for, right? And he's like, well, this is what I want. And I'm like, okay, thank you very much for your application. We will consider it. And I, I just, I, I, I look at, I, I've, even gone as far as to ask uh, students who are graduating from local community colleges and uh, state colleges, what do you expect when you get out of college? And they're like, well, I'd like to work for the state as an, as an archaeologist and get paid like about $45,000 a year and have a five day a week job and maybe do a little bit of field work and some excavations and cool things like that. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you, what? I, I, I I get, I get, I get frustrated because people sometimes in college aren't coming out in reality. And additionally, they're transferring their own responsibilities, their own decisions onto a company that's saying, hey, we're going to pay you 13 to $16 an hour to go dig holes in the worst possible conditions. That's, that's what, that's what's out there. It doesn't matter to me if you have a master's degree or a, or a bachelor's degree. So <laughs> I could keep so, going. Go ahead and jump in. No, once well, again, oh, yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I was going to say, well, that is, I think that's a huge problem, and that goes back to the sort of general problems of, you know, university and training people across the board is it used to be you could get a degree, get out, get a decent job, a permanent job, and make it through, you know, until you retired, and that's no longer the case, but no one's telling students there and to be honest it's a bit hard to find that information i think we all know it my blog bill's blog might be the only place that tells people that by the way you know you're only going to be making 13 16 dollars when you get out and you may only have contracts for two weeks at a time if you're lucky and that that information needs to be there but that's the problem is universities don't want to say that you don't want to tell people, oh, come get this degree. Um, your chances of being able to pay off the $50,000 that you take out to get this degree are almost nil. Um, and, you know, it's not realistic. But that information has to be out there. And it's a huge thing is people are coming out with unrealistic expectations, hugely unrealistic expectations. Sonia, I wish your, your thing was just a sort of one off. But there's a lot of people who kind of have this expectation of archaeology that somehow their beginning salaries can be at sixty or eighty thousand um, dollars, when even like professors, associate professors, are lucky if they're making sixty. 
after 10 or 15 years. Um, and it's just, it, it's a huge problem. And then, you know, people get, basically you have expectations and then when those expectations aren't met, they're disappointed and then they get angry. And then Bill comes along and tells them that uh, they, those expectations <laughs> weren't real and they take that anger out on Bill. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I guess they take it. I I kind of incited it upon myself. I I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> but you're right, man. The reason the reason why I even started doing this is because I wanted people to know the truth, the truth that no one ever told me. Well, let's uh let's bring this back after break, um, and we'll let uh we'll come back and we'll let Sonia ponder hiring me uh for her company at ninety thousand dollars a year just to podcast and blog about every single thing she does. So. That's Dude, what I'll do. I don't even I'll make also that tweet. much money, man. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't even make that much. <laughs> All right. That reminds me, Sonia, we need to um, confirm our appointment at the Tesla factory because we're business owners right, and we're right. going to go get our, our Model X. So. Right, okay. right, right. <laughs> All right. Coming back in a second. Profiles in CRM, a weekly podcast. Ask CRM professionals eight simple questions. The first questions establish education, location, and experience. The last questions are a reflection of that experience, and the answers will surprise you. Check out the show on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash profiles. On that page, you can also request to be interviewed for the show. It only takes 20 minutes, and you don't need any special equipment. Let's get back to the show. All right, we're back for our last segment, and we're going to talk about, well, we'll probably veer from this immediately, like we always do, but we're going to talk about some of the Facebook comments, and one of them is from a good friend of mine, Katie. Uh, she was the very first comment on the post, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically, she was, um, to quote her, infuriated by the uh, by the post, and or by Bill's blog post, but one of the things she mentioned in there is something that's constantly brought up, um, constantly brought up, and she's... <laughs> She may have done this a little tongue in cheek because she was pissed, but she said, "Why do you even need a BA?" You know, she's talking about, you know, hiring people with master's degrees, implying that, uh, you know, you need a BA to even do this job. Uh, she said, "Why don't you just train people right out of high school?" Because, uh, you know, one of the comments on her comment was, "Yeah, true, you can teach a monkey to survey, quote, you know, but, but they need to be able to interpret, and you get the interpretation from college. All that's a whole bunch of BS because you can teach a lot of that stuff in the field, okay." In fact, in fact, most people I've worked with, um, probably including myself, that get into CRM archaeology, probably like ninety-five percent of what we know we learn in the field on our first job and on our jobs, you know, coming into that. And and you're constantly learning something new every single time you go out. You know, um, I mean, I didn't even learn I didn't learn Munsells even in in college. Honestly, I mean, I never saw them. Um, actually, I did see them in my first field school, but it wasn't really explained what it was. But uh, so a lot of stuff we learn, we learn out there, but we don't get degrees. To me, we don't get degrees right now for, from a contract um, business standpoint in archaeology. We don't get degrees so we can learn how to be, uh, you know, we can learn how to interpret the archaeological record or, uh, or, you know, do all this fun stuff. We need degrees in our field so we can justify all that pay that you guys want, um, all you field techs, that you guys want better pay, more security, more stability, more stability. But you're not going to get that if the rest of the industry, the rest of the environmental industry, the people that are actually hiring us say, oh, why would I hire all these people over here with this education at uh, $20 an hour when I can hire these people over here that we can train to do this for minimum wage? Okay. Um, you, can, you can teach somebody how to pull shots at Starbucks for minimum wage. You can also teach somebody how to walk in the desert and point out interesting things for minimum wage. But we enforce the degrees to me. It's not. It's not so you can learn how to do that. The degree is. I mean, it helps, but the degree is so we can justify maintaining our level of pay and and if not increasing it as we um, as we increase what that means. So, I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, is that totally way off base? Obviously, we can teach just about anybody to do some of the stuff, especially at the field tech level. You know, moving up, you might need not a degree but leadership experience, which you also don't learn in a graduate program. But um, I don't know, Stephen. What do you got? Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a. Uh, this is gonna go be ahead, a shame. Go ahead. 
Um, <laughs> I, I th- this goes back to one of our perennial topics of you know does a degree get you anything? And yeah. I think on the technical level, um, you know, a lot of what we need as field techs. Yeah, you know, it's like I, I, you know, if I need someone to run a total station, I can teach how to do a total station. If I need someone to use a Munsell, I can teach how to use a Munsell. Uh, you want to dig a shovel? T- do we need shovel tests? I can teach, you know, like give me any person off the street and I can, and, you know, I can show them the technical way of doing that. The problem with that is, you know, where the education comes in is it, it's, it's, you know, going back to that old archaeological mantra, it's all about the context. Mm-hmm. You know, why are we doing shovel tests? Why are we doing it this way? Why are we, you know, doing doing our sampling in, in this strategy? Why are certain types of artifacts important, but other types of artifacts not important? Um, all all this stuff is, you know, drives our our, our you know basically our business. You know, the technical aspects. And, yep. and so, while, you know, I can teach anybody, you know, all the skills that we need to do out in the field. Um, y- you know, like I don't have time or the budget or anything like that. And, and you know, and I'm using me as, as the example, but, you know, I'm not really boss right now. But like any boss, you know, we don't have the budget for that. We're, we're not here to train you to understand why you're doing what you're doing. That's mm-hmm. what school is. And, and, you know, where the grad, grad degree comes in over the undergrad degree is more of the, the managerial stuff. You know, can you write? And, and I, I know Bill's written a lot about how it didn't teach him to write properly. But, you know, I, I guarantee you that coming out of a grad program, he was better at writing than he was going in. Um, you know, that that schooling is giving you a skill set and that isn't necessarily something that, you know, that the bosses are willing to do as on the job training. Um, and, and, you know, we, we can argue about, you know, the, the essential things and whether it's giving you the, you know, what you really feel like you needed up for the job, um, anything like that. But, you know, really it's, you know, that, that's what it's training. And, and I, I will say to add to that, specifically, it's training you, you know, our degrees are training you to be archaeologists, which may not be the best thing for long term employment within CRM. You know, um, you know, consider taking an ethnography class or an applied anthropology class, um, things that, you know, are peripherally related to the sorts of you know, projects and stuff like that, that we do, um, that might be more beneficial in the long term. Steven, though, this is the problem is we say that, sure, you can learn a lot of that stuff in your undergrad if you take the right classes or if you go to the right program. The problem is people go into this undergrad program out of high school and they've never heard of archaeology before. They've never heard of, well, they've heard of archaeology. They've never heard of CRM archaeology before, most likely. And so they don't know what classes to take, and they don't know what schools to go to. And quite frankly, a lot of people are going to go to an undergrad program that's near where they live because it's cheaper. So they're not going to choose a program that has an emphasis in contract archaeology, and they can learn a lot of this stuff that we need to learn on the job. So that's that's a huge problem. But that's why that's why undergrad is teaching you to be a technician. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm talking about grad school. When you're going on for your master's, that's when you're starting to move up. That that's why I. Uh, oh, go ahead. Brad, what it what it's getting? Yeah, you you don't necessarily know where you're, you know, like which classes to take. But that's the that is the responsibility of the program, right? That, yeah. Oh, hey, you know, maybe you know, you, maybe you need to learn about how to do archaeology on a very gross level. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe you should. Uh, you know, especially now that like consultation, um, sacred sites, other aspects of cultural resources are becoming more prevalent or prominent. Well, this this um, is why we that, need a middle step. You consider a four field undergrad degree rather than your specifically archaeology focused degree. Right. 
But like I said, this is why we need a middle step. We need we need undergrad, and then because you can't control for the parameters within that school, you can't control what they're going to teach. I mean, I I've said numerous times my undergrad program, you know, CRM was a bullet point on a slide, right? So a lot of the stuff that we need to know. I mean, sure, I learned what a what a feature is and an artifact is and things like that, and I learned how to flint nap and I learned some other things in my undergrad program, which has helped me, um, you know, be a better archaeologist, but. Uh, if I'd known I was going into contract archaeology and some of the things we specifically have to deal with, then I would have probably chosen a different program or chosen different classes within that program. Um, but, uh, you know, this is why we need a second step. And, and we're not ready to, to quite announce this yet. But let me just tell you, something is coming out that will help provide that second step. So you don't need to go to grad school right away. But you come out of your undergrad, you take this second step, I'm going to call it. And then you're prepared to be a field technician, okay? And you can come back and back to it, back to it. And it's you know we're gonna we're gonna be putting this thing out in April, hopefully, and and it's gonna be ramping up from there. But uh, stay tuned for that. Um, but I don't know. What do you guys? Well, what do you guys think about this? Yeah, Bill. I was just gonna comment that now we are starting to see a lot more uh, instructor and professor job posts that specifically ask for cultural resource management. And I know a lot of the folks there at the University of Arizona, they're finishing their PhDs. And we're starting to see these job posts to me that make me feel really good. And like maybe I actually have better than, you know, a ghost chance of actually teaching someday for a living by uh, seeing posts that say you got to have cultural resource management experience at the, you know, field director level at least. They're looking for PIs and other folks who have actually, uh, you know, worked at companies and gotten contracts to teach classes and you know they'll, they'll still have the course load of you know introductory archaeology classes or maybe undergraduate archaeology classes they'll also they're looking for folks that have a phd so they'll be able to teach graduate seminars but it'll be individuals that have a crm background and not just a few years experience you know they're trying to get some of the middle to upper management crmers to teach courses at universities and it's not just like new mexico or you know, uh, other places, Arizona doesn't seem to be doing it right now. However, there are several people on the staff that did CRM and still do CRM. So you can actually learn from folks like that. And they, they do have a pretty good CRM class, but it is starting to come to a head. And I don't think that it's, you know, blog posts or whatever that are, that are making this realization happen. It's the fact that departments are realizing that their folks can't find jobs. Uh, and so they're trying to create the courses uh, they will help them. And the first step was to show a CRM course, right? Like Sonia was talking about a CRM course where you read Newman and Sanford and Tom King, and we write a couple papers and we maybe make a, a budget that may or may not be realistic. The next step that we're starting to see now is hiring actual cultural resource management folks to teach these courses. So the undergrads will, it won't just be a bullet point. It actually will be an understanding that when you finish school, you're not going to be Indiana Jones. You're not going to be a professor like me. You're going to do cultural resource management. And that is awesome because you that's how you actually find out about the past. Like, you know, we do one or two projects a summer. CRM's like one or two projects a day. I really don't like the idea of turning uh, school into training specifically for CRM. Because CRM is not all of archaeology. I mean, it, it's prevalent. It's what we do. Um, but there needs to be other, you know, I, I mean, we, we need to leave open the idea that, you know, this isn't training, you're learning how to be an archaeologist. And then the way that that gets applied is how you get out there and do it. And, and you could be using your archaeological training for all sorts of careers that would not normally be considered archaeology. But if you turn it into a tech school where it's like, I'm going to teach you how to do CRM, that that closes the door to other things. And, 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 and what we really need to be concerned about is that because we are pumping out more and more uh, grads and, and, and more and more people with degrees, that there are not going to be that many jobs in CRM. There's not going to be jobs for everybody in CRM. And the education is, 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 is particularly at the undergrad level, um, it is not about I'm going to make you, you know, the best, you know, archaeologist. It's I'm preparing you to go out and be a professional in life. And, and the archaeology skills that you acquire are applicable in a lot of different ways. I mean, Chris is always talking about, you know, finding your own way of, you know, you, you got to work your, 
find your own way to dealing with the system. And this is it. You are taking what you've learned and your job experiences and in a certain professional grade, entrepreneurial sort of thing, you're going out there and applying it in different ways. Mm-hmm. Which, which is why you have gen ed classes, which is why you have liberal arts cl- classes, which is why you have classes outside of your particular major. Well, you know, I agree with you, Stephen. Um, I, you shouldn't have just an undergrad program specifically focused on CRM. Um, you can have a graduate program focused on that because that's intended to be uh, I see graduate school for archaeologists more as like a tech school. You know, you go in and and you you learn something specific. You don't, you're not just going there for the master's degree, but you're going there to, to actually study something. Um, that being said, I think most undergrad programs are a huge waste of time because they're unfocused. So you spend your first couple of years, you know, There's getting your general education. Okay. Well, I, I understand that, but they can be a little bit more focused, you know, or at least give you the option because, it, well, I got two things to say on that. One you, you go for a couple of years, you take your gen eds, you, you learn the broad topics, and then you can focus a little more closely than you, than you normally can. You know, if, if you, if you decided that you wanted to go into CRM, the classes should be there to allow you to, you know, start narrowing that focus a little more. Um, that being said, you know, I think you're right. If you don't get a job in CRM, you need to be able to use that archaeology degree to do something else. But I think a CRM archaeologist with our, with our rigor and our standards and our, and our, our need to, um, to have, you know, checklists and do everything perfect because of the budget, because of efficiency, I think we're way better archaeologists than some of those wishy-washy academic programs out there. I mean, I've seen some data that Ooh. comes out of some academic <laughs> programs. I mean, come on. We've seen it. We've all seen it. Uh, it's not, that's not all of it, man. That's not, it's not all of it. No, you're right. You're right. But I think in general, CRM archeology span is, is way more, way more precise, just like as a whole. And, and, and we have better standards. I mean, I just saw an academic program. Uh, I'm, it's, I'm just saying it's over in Europe and they've got like nine years of data and they've got all these level forms from excavating every field season and not a goddamn one of them has, uh, an elevation on it. They didn't take opening and closing elevations for their levels and their arbitrary levels based on how many artifacts they found. And I'm like, are you kidding me? How can you spatially? Yeah. I mean, this is just what they did because they, were, they weren't concerned with it. But a CRM project would have collected the data, whether it was useful or not, and then we'd have it, right? So Get them, Stephen. I, I would agree. I, I've seen way <laughs> too much stuff just handedly dismissed in CRM projects. Yeah. Well, I, I have to like you're right, you're all, right. all of all, the whole historical component so that you can get to the archaic. Like, we don't care about any of this. Let's just rip off this entire ranch and this entire other phase. And then we're just going to go straight for this zone because that's more efficient. We need that. We'll, we'll start our opening elevations after we've stripped four feet off the top. <laughs> Billy, your trash belongs in a landfill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to tell people if they want to get a job in cultural resources, learn your damn historical artifacts and learn how to characterize a building. If you know how yeah. to characterize a road or a bridge and you know every single thing that was made in the last 200 years, it doesn't matter what you what experience, what degree you've got. You'll be the only person on the crew that can tell you what exact year that bottle was made or what that, you know, glass even means. So, yeah, if you want to stay alive, learn historical. Well, okay, we've got a we've got a few minutes left here uh, to the end of this podcast. Um, Bill, did you did you learn anything from the comments on Facebook on the two groups you posted this in? So for anybody uh, that didn't see it, Archeo Field Techs, spelled A R C H A E O, uh, Space Field Space Techs, and then North American Archaeological Field Tech Forum or Tech Forum. Um, did you learn anything, or did you change your mind on any of that yeah. stuff based on some of the comments? No, I well, you know, I I didn't change my mind. But the the entire blog post series was supposed to be three in a row because, you know, 9,000 words is pretty hard to eat at one chunk. So I broke it down into pieces, right? So, you know, I, uh, I, I, I just – I don't know what to say as far as the degree inflation because I'm actually a product of it. I live it every day. And I am there with Steven every single step of the way when we're supposed to be training folks for the future as a TA, uh, you know, at a highly vaunted – uh, university, I spend a lot of time helping individuals learn how to write and learn and teaching them how to read a textbook because you, you got to know that stuff, man. It cannot just be emoticons in text. It's got to be grammatically correct, you know? So we have a lot of writing in these and, and, and archaeology and anthropology are perfect classes to teach writing and to teach reading and analysis skills, right? So that's, that's pretty much what I spend my whole time uh, doing. 
And none of these people, the hundred and something students, undergrads, like 19 year old students that have just gotten to Arizona, none of them plan on doing archaeology, not a single one. But I know that after watching them, every single one of them understands the basic structure of an, uh, like an article or how to position themselves and how to back up statements with evidence and how to put it all together in a grammatically correct paragraph. That I've seen that happen. And they all know how to uh, think about evolution and think about the world and, and just basically how we know what we know about the past. And they don't have to necessarily know every single hominin species or every bit of archaeology, how it all works. But they understand the general concept. And they're 19. I mean, they're mm -hmm. going to live for years and years now knowing those ideas. They know it. They know why evolution exists and how it, it wasn't just made up one day, right? Right. Uh, as far as the blog post series goes, uh, and as far as the whole clickbait claims, which I will, I'll say that that wasn't my, you know, <laughs> that wasn't my topic. If you look, there's hundreds of other posts that are not just clickbait titles, right? At any yeah. rate, uh, people get really, really, um, it, it hits close to home when you go after a uh, college education or when you talk about degrees. It's a very emotional topic in the United States. And I'd agree with Doug as well. I, it's probably in every single industry. It's a, it's a major thing that universities have to deal with. You know, how are universities going to balance their obligations to cultivate knowledge versus the societal prestige that's conveyed on individuals for having college degrees? I mean, yeah. is it something that they need to care about? So far, it doesn't seem like it really is something. But we're approaching a time when... Uh, no longer will students be able to go to college. They won't be able to afford it. So at that point, what do we do? It's not like we're creating more scholarships. The, the education is mandatory. They need to have it. Like you can't even really manage a grocery store unless you have a bachelor's degree. What mm -hmm. are we going to do? The United States is no longer a, a labor, a blue collar country anymore. You know, we don't really make very many products. And so uh, in this knowledge-based world, that's, you know, centers around the prestige and the uh, understanding that uh, you've learned something in college, what are we going to do to all the disenfranchised individuals? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's not, Sonia's exactly right. It is not up to the company to choose who gets to work there or who takes a tech job, whether they have a PhD or whatever. It's actually economically viable for them to hire master's people, even though they may not be able to keep them because the experience built up over time will help them with that degree to actually get a career for themselves. Yep. But this is something we all have to face and, and have to deal with, you know. What are we going to do? Uh, so what I learned from all the responses is that through emotional, uh, a approaching sensitive topics and bringing up the kind of things that you don't want to think about, it forces you to think about them. And whether you're coming after me on Facebook or whether, you know, you don't like what I said or whether you completely agree, we bring up something that's not going to be brought up anywhere else besides the bar. Yep, you're absolutely right, Bill. Um, all right, well, we're gonna we're gonna finish this discussion now uh, before we um, before we lose the remainder of our listeners. Um, and I know this podcast is coming out after the SAAs, so there's no point in me saying don't show up with a pitchfork because I think I'll be the only one there out of all of us. So um, anyway, yeah, next uh, next year we. Let's schedule the panel for next year. I can't actually go this year. It's yeah. like one week away, right? I mean, yeah, I can't get a plane week. ticket there that fast. No, no, so, no. But Vancouver. Vancouver. Vancouver or wherever. Yeah. Even if we can't get it together for Vancouver, let's talk about it because it's not going to go away. I'd like for everyone to – we need some you know, uh, department heads, some anthro department presidents to be on there. We mm -hmm. need some CRM company people who own companies. And then we need some yeah, uh, people from the park service and other places that do hiring. We need a, a cast of characters. Yeah. I can be over on the dunk tank where you guys all throw baseballs <laughs> to get me in the water. <laughs> Don't attack the others. But I want some of these people. I want us all to sit in a room and talk. Yeah. You know? I'd be up for that. Well, and uh, all right. So we're going to end it. And, and I'll just say uh, I'll just say real quick, Bill, so we can get it on the podcast. Um, after you get your PhD and your Dr. White, um, I've got a field tech position ready for you at Dig Tech because, uh, <laughs> because you don't have any recent uh, Great Basin experience. So, um, you know, I've got a I've got a $15 an hour job with your name on it. 
Not only that, but because I will be a starving man that has a family to feed, I'll gladly take that position at $15 an hour, just like I did cleaning toilets with a master's degree 10 years ago. Just like nice. I've taken every tech job since then, man. I'm not afraid of going out there until my back finally breaks. I'll be out there if anyone needs me. <laughs> nice. All right. Leave your comments wherever you saw this. We're out. Thanks, guys. That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash CRM Arc Podcast. If you like the show and want to comment, please do. You can leave comments about this or any other episode on the website or on the iTunes page for the episode. You can also email me at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com or use the contact form on the podcast webpage. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or tweet your questions with the hashtag CRM Arc Podcast podcast or you can tag at arcpodnet in your tweet please share the link to the show wherever you saw it if you share crm archaeology related items on twitter or facebook or anywhere else for that matter be sure to use the hashtag crm arc so the community can see and comment if you'd like to subscribe to this podcast you can do so on itunes or on stitcher radio you can also type the name of the podcast into your favorite podcasting app and subscribe that way don't forget to go over to itunes and leave a review of the show it helps us get noticed so more people can find our podcast and benefit from the content also, send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Also, please consider donating to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Your donations help fund our bandwidth and contribute to our editing costs. Thanks to everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. Bye. Adios. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to arcpodnet.com slash members for more info.